thing here in this room is a will. half a mile and then I stopped my car and I got out and looked up and I could see a white uh, looking object in the distance. I thought it was an overturned car at first uh, but I got into my patrol car and went up closer to it and uh, when I started to get out of the car I could uh, I heard a big roar. As I got to it I could see uh, a couple of uh, looked like a couple of uh, coveralls uh, hanging from a close line. I couldn't see what it was, but it looked like a couple of corals. Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Mystery Vault podcast. I'm your host, RJ McCready. And for this episode, we're going to be taking a look at the Lonnie Zamora UFO incident. Uh, now, I want to imagine that most of you are familiar with this incident. And when you think about UFO cases, I immediately think about Roswell and Area 51 just to say but um, I would imagine that most of you would be familiar with the police officer that came across that egg shaped uh, UFO in the desert that's what I'm going to be talking about today so a quick synopsis on that it's uh, alleged that the UFO sighting happened in April 24th 1964 near Sorocco in New Mexico and the police officer Lonnie Samora claimed he saw two people beside a shiny egg shaped object that later rose into the air accompanied by a roaring flame. Now this story drew the attention at the time of the media, UFO investigators and the US Air Force and also to mention Project Blue Book which I haven't mentioned on the show yet so I'll go into that a little bit later on. So just uh, let's talk a little bit about Sorocco, uh, the county, which is the U.S. state of New Mexico. It's in the Rio Grande Valley. It's 74 miles south of Albuquerque. And it's got a very small population um, of 9,000 people. So it's that sleepy old town in one of the U.S. states. And... Uh, when I think of that, it's in the desert, and it's the first thing that comes to mind is like those old 1950s B movies where you get like the invasion of the saucer men, or you get a giant tarantula turn up, or the uh, the classic movie. Then we're kind of steering into my bite-sized cinema project, uh, territory here, but um, yeah, you think of that sleepy old town with the local sheriff or the deputy or the police officer who's you know stumbles across something and. That's what I like about this case is that it, this is it. You know, this is this is what's happened. Supposedly, a you know a police officer in the local town has come across what he claims to be a UFO, and I love that. And that's what I love about this case. It's great. It's just uh, it's like I say, it's got 1950s B movie written all over it. And the thing about this is it's. One of the most convincing UFO incidents of all time. It's credible because it's a police officer that's come forward here at the time where he probably doesn't want to lose his credibility. And I'll talk about Lonnie in a minute. And to this day, there's no solid explanation. There's nothing conclusive to say, you know, this is exactly what it is. No one's come forward. United States Air Force got investigated the case. And they haven't given an explanation for it. Well, maybe they do know, they just don't want to tell us. There we go, I'll start with the uh, conspiracy there. But um, let's go back to 1964. Let's go back to this sleepy town of Sorocco. And let's start with Police Sergeant um, Lonnie Samora. So he was a he currently served five years with the police. He was a patrolman in the local town. Um, he was known as a mature guy. He was dependable by the local town. He was sober and he wasn't known to engage in any flights of fancy or any big anything up. He was a guy that pretty much told it as it is. Uh, the only thing he wasn't very popular with the local 
teenagers in the town, I'm not talking about the teenagers that like to drive around in their cars and speed around and stuff like that, because he was constantly giving them speeding tickets. And I would imagine in this small town, that's probably the most exciting thing that was going to happen to Lonnie Samora, which is the case on uh, April 24th, 1964, at 17.45pm. It was exactly that. Lonnie got into his patrol car. He saw a car speed by him. It's one of the local teenagers. And he was thinking that, he was probably thinking, this was probably going to be the most exciting thing that's going to happen to him today. So he pursued the car, he's thinking I'm going to write this guy up and chased the car out into the desert and whilst he was driving he noticed a, a large uh, flash um, he described it as like a fireball, he thought it was a fire, or maybe that something had crashed in the desert so he went to go and investigate so the other, the other thing you could say here is that the the other driver could be saying, I, I managed to avoid a speeding ticket by a UFO, so that was the case for him as well. But um, Zamora went to go and investigate. Um, I would say he thought he was perhaps maybe an aircraft that crashed or a car that might have crashed in the desert. And as he was driving closer, he managed to call up on to dispatch to try and tell them what was going on. Um, but then he experienced some static, so his communications were going down. And as he got closer, he found a large object um, which stood on four legs. It was an egg-shaped obje object, as he described, which was metallic. Uh, at first, his first thoughts, he thought it was an upturned car. But then as he got closer, he realised it was something else. It was something that he, he, could, he had not seen you know, before. He was also a guy who was also familiar with aircraft. So he knew about airborne vehicles and the other strange thing here was next to the this object were two beings and he described them as small adults wearing white overalls and he startled them, they looked back at him, they ran back to the craft. Um, Zamora this time made a second attempt to try and contact dispatch but there was still static on the radio. And as he looked back, the two beings disappeared and he heard a clunking noise that sounded like a, a car door closing. And he said he was about 20 metres away at this time. And he also noticed a symbol on the uh, side of the, the craft, which was a arc with an arrow in the middle, uh, which was red in colour. And then the craft moved upwards, there was a flame that came out from the bottom of it. He said it, it made like a roaring sound. He said it wasn't like anything that he heard before with aircraft. Uh, it wasn't like a blast, he said it was like a roar. And then there was like a blue and orange flame which came from below the craft. And he said that the strange thing about it was it made like a high and then a low frequency. Uh, the craft shot up into the air and then the flame disappeared and then it just hovered in the air for a bit and then it just moved westward and vanished. Samora was terrified, he ran away, he dropped his glasses onto the floor and then he managed to get back onto dispatch and he called his sergeant Sam Chavez, uh, he was a close friend of his and within about 30 minutes or so Chavez came out uh, to investigate. And the first thing that Chavez noticed about Zamora was just how shocked and terrified he looked and you know he was a guy who was usually quite calm but he was sweating, he looked pale, uh, he was like shaking, he was trying to put his words together and he, he was just giving this like convincing story as if he was a, a guy who had just seen something strange. Uh, bearing in mind that he, you know, he's been a police officer for five years, so I think at this point um, it's kind of what makes this story a little bit credible. So Moore and Chavez go to investigate the site where the craft took off from, and they found four holes about nine inches deep, and they, there was smoke coming off from the site, and there was a, a large area of burnt sand, and 
the sand had been burnt to such an intense heat that it actually turned into glass. And there was also like the surrounding hedges that had been burnt and, and uh, scorched. So they called up the um, state police for backup. The United States Air Force were there within 90 minutes. And journalists and the media turned up. So this then became a big story. Um, people started to gain interest in it. Uh, to note, the United States Air Force were based 100 miles away from um, White Sands, uh, which is a missile base. I'll get into that in a minute. And immediately, the United States Air Force, when they turned up, they claimed that none of their aircraft were involved. And upon inspection of the site with the four holes, which are nine inches deep and they were smouldering in the burnt sand, uh, they did confirm that whatever it was, it was a very heavy, heavy object. But regardless of this, the army captain uh, he was in charge, which was Richard T. Holder, he decided that he, he needed to contain the area just in case of uh, contamination, so they sealed it off with the United States Air Army and this is where you start to get a little bit of a glimmer of a cover-up so uh, one of the state police officers who turned up, Ted Jordan, he actually had a camera uh, on his person and he was taking photographs of the actual site and this was kind of like the the gold now I suppose you could say this is where you're going to grab all your evidence and someone with a camera right now is, 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 is going to capture some great stuff so Ted Jordan was taking photos and this is where it kind of gets a little bit interesting because even though the United States Air Force have turned up and said no it's not it's not one of ours and you could say, if you start going into the realms of um, Lonnie Samora making this up, let's just say uh, the United States Air Force are that concerned that they need to seal this area off. I suppose it is like a type of protocol. What becomes interesting here, right at this very instance, is that the officer, Ted Jordan, who's taking photographs, he's then had that uh, camera confiscated by the Air Force. So the way I look at that, having done some research here, I would say that is the first point that the Air Force have actually gone, I don't want someone taking photographs of this. So they were obviously a little bit concerned about this, regardless of whatever, which way you want to look at this, some, that, that camera was confiscated. And as it turns out, they took it away. They gave the camera back to Officer Jordan, a little bit later on, but they took the film away from it and they said, no, no, the um, film was contaminated with radiation and nothing came out. Um, the other thing that's interesting about this is this was probably one of the most vital bits of evidence, which let's say they, they probably did develop the pictures, they just haven't released it. Um, Officer Ted Jordan did say that not only did he take pictures of the crash site, of the the burnt sand and the indentations in, in the sand as well with what Lonnie Samora was saying but he also said that he took the footprints of the the beings that were stood by the craft so this camera would be a, a nice smoking gun to support Lonnie Zamora's um, account but unfortunately that disappeared so yeah, that's where the cover-up conspiracy starts to come in from, from that point onwards. So the other thing here is you've also got other witnesses. Now there was um, a service station manager that supported Lonnie Samora's um, story here by saying that that afternoon um, someone pulled into the gas station. It turned out to be a guy called Paul, Paul Kyes. Uh, who was later interviewed much later in 1978 who, who gave a, a further account but basically what he said was to the service um, station manager was man you you know your aircraft seem to fly pretty low around these areas he was just passing through and the gas station guy came out and said well must have been a helicopter or something like that because you know we've got a, a, a missile base you know in white sands but 
Uh, Paul Kais came back and said, no, no, it wasn't a helicopter. He said it was like a, an egg-shaped object. Um, and then the station manager said to him, oh, what did you call the police? He said, no, I didn't have to because I saw a police officer chasing after it. So he basically tied up the Samora story, which is interesting. And then he later got interviewed and he also said that, you know, it was like a, an egg-shaped object. So that kind of just ties this story together. Um, so already you've got like a building platform here of Lonnie Samora's story. Uh, Ted Jordan taking photographs that was confiscated by the army. Then you have other witnesses as well that have um, put in an account. Uh, the other interesting witness that's come forward as well, or what's interesting here is someone actually called in 15 minutes before Lonnie Samora's encounter. Um, and this was someone called Albuquerque TV station who was uh, reporting a large object flying south of the city uh, going towards Sirocco. But even though you had these eyewitnesses uh, accounts, uh, the media was quick to shrug it off as a hoax and they were saying that Lonnie Samora was making this up just to bring a little bit of fame um, and possibly some tourist attraction to the sleepy town of Sirocco. So unlike the Roswell incident where it was hit the, the media and they thought that they found a UFO, this one got dampened down very quickly by the media and the United States Air Force, which might make you think that the Air Force at this time had probably learned their lesson from Roswell and thought, you know, if we get a case like this, we need to, we need to get in there quick and act. So there's all those types of uh, conspiracies that you could possibly look at if you relate it to the um, Roswell case. Then, uh, as I mentioned, uh, there was uh, Project Blue Book. There was a Lieutenant Colonel Hector Quintanilla who got involved and he wrote up a report basically saying that this is nothing major and nothing of concern. But when there was the... Um, Project Blue Book basically released a lot of their reports and apparently there was two reports that came out at the time and the second report, uh, which is now open to access for people to have a look at, it actually says that it, they were actually concerned about it. They didn't know what it was and they felt that it was something that they needed to contain, they needed to look at um, something that wasn't a secret experiment or something that they could take ownership of. Now, uh, Project Blue Book, I've mentioned this, this was a organisation that was put together by the United States Air Force to investigate UFOs, basically. They put a team together. It was formed in 1952 and then disbanded in 1970. Over this time, they investigated 12,618 UFO cases for... 701 of those cases for them to be unexplained up until today and one of those cases out of the 701 is the Lonnie Samora case which makes this interesting so this this is falling into that category where they cannot explain what this is. It's also worth mentioning that there was a astronomer who was assigned to investigate the site he went there with uh, Lonnie Samora his name was uh, Dr Heinrich and what's interesting to hear that with him working with Lonnie Samora, he actually came out and said what, what I liked about him was that he came across as convincing. It didn't seem like someone who was making this up. So that adds to the evidence of uh, Lonnie Samora's credibility. Because I suppose, you know, when you look at this case, it's I think with a lot of UFO cases is, are people making this up? And I think in 1964, what takes takes me back to that beginning building block is Lonnie Samara was a police officer with some credibility and would he want to destroy that credibility by making up a story that he had seen a UFO. So with all the other evidence, it is building some credibility to, to this story, which makes it a... Uh, it's an interesting talk, case in the in the mystery UFO world. So let's move on to some theories of what this could have been. 
realistically, which I always like to talk about on, on this show, um, some, some scientists have come out and said it could have been ball lightning, uh, which is a natural phenomenon that happens. It could have been a mirage. I'm just throwing these ones in there. These, these are ones that have been put online. Um, a hot air balloon. Um, or could it have just been the fact that Lonnie Samore just made this up as a hoax? Before I go into that though, um, what is interesting, what, what is very, very sort of plausible here is in 1964 in, at the White Sands Missile Base, um, scientists were actually working on a lunar probe um, for the space race. Now the lunar probe is what you would be familiar with, with the, um, I don't know if you remember like the Viking one, which um, actually landed on, on Mars and he would have had some landing rods and it would have probably had a fuel bottle in the middle to propel it and it would have actually had a uh, thruster which would have come out from the bottom so this does tie up with what Samora did see in the desert it's the only plausible thing it just it just seems a bit weird how the local missile base which is where the United States Air Force were actually based and they came to the site um, but this would have been common knowledge to the public because of the space race at the time. Um, the other thing is, is that the probe was actually used on that day in 1964, and they were doing um, some test work on it. But it was actually a helicopter was actually used to um, escort it around. But I guess the question is, is that if it was the scientists working on this space probe and that's the other thing if this is what ties it up with the two beings you know, dressed in white overalls that could be a couple of scientists working on the probe so all this does um, tie up but the other thing is that they, they, would they have taken it 100 miles away from from the base and I imagine if they were experimenting on it it probably would have been in a um, contained area that they possibly would have picked to say you know you, you know because imagine these types of experiments are very very well organized and conducted and they'll probably pick a location to say this is where we're going to experiment on the other thing is um let's just say that's what it is you know let's just say that that craft landed just outside Sirocco with a couple of scientists and you know Lonnie Samara turned up and the scientists thought well, let's get out of here they moved away. What? When one did the United States Air Force just come out and tell the public that this was us working on the lunar um, craft? And I think the public would have just bought into that. Oh, okay, it's just a couple of scientists working on the lunar craft because then that story would just tie all this up and Lonnie Samora would say, oh, okay, I, I, I thought it was something else. Do you know what I mean? That would really just put a lid on, on this more than anything else because at that time the public and Lonnie Samora would say oh okay it's to do with the um, space race because you know in a couple of years time we're going to be going to the moon and obviously you already would have had all the you know the X-15 flights and you know the, the right stuff and all that sort of stuff so um, this is what makes it strange from our point of view you know looking into these mysteries is so why why are the United States Air Force not not telling us that and why are they concerned about it? So what is it? Um, and if let's just say it was a hoax from Lonnie Zamora's point of view, then surely the United States Air Force would say, oh no, it's just a hoax. This guy's just making this up. You know, it's nothing for us to worry about. But they were worried about it to the point where they got investigators to go in and have a look at it and that's the question why you, that's what makes this all kind of like okay this is strange and they did interview Lonnie Samora quite a lot to the point where he got fed up with this case to the point where he just chucked his towel in and said I've had enough of this got himself a job as a petrol station manager and he avoided all media and UFOologists um, so yeah he, he got fed up with it I think he just got taken through the coals interviewed um, but the other thing I need to mention here as well, um, 
well, I'm going into the possibilities. It's quite interesting as well. Um, Lonnie Samora used to work for the New Mexico Tech University. And the students deal with pyrotechnics there. So they had access to explosives and all those, all those types of things. And apparently uh, Lonnie Samora wasn't very, very popular with uh, the local the students at their university at the time. So there is this theory that they knew that Samora was working in the town of Sirocco and that the students um, wanted to tease him by setting up this whole thing. So you could say that they set up the whole thing even to the point where they thought, let's get let's, let's, let's draw his attention. Let's wait for him. Let's get a car to speed by because that's what he likes. Get the, get the speeding car to go out in the desert. And then cause an explosion in the desert and then make it look like he's seeing something strange. Um, <laughs> plausible, but the technology back then, if it was something that he saw fly off into the sky, even back in 1964, didn't have that, that, that drone technology that we have now, or did they? I don't know, but there you go. That's that's one of the one of the theories. But one of the other things is um, after all this time. Uh, people were saying that surely by now someone would come forward to say hey, that this whole thing was a prank from the university but no one has come forward um, yet but uh, that's another theory that is is out there so um, yeah it's, it's caused yeah it's a bit of a scratchy head moment um, the other thing is going back to that lunar probe which I didn't mention as well if it was a lunar probe then uh, why did Lonnie not say that there was anything he said that there was a strange hieroglyphic type um, symbol on the side of the craft, but not United States Air Force or NASA or anything like that. So, um, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a bit of a scratchy head mystery, which has fallen into the uh, mystery coffee table books, as I've mentioned before. But it's a good one. I like this case. I think it's fascinating. I love it. I love it. And I said it, it, it does remind me of that. Uh, 1950s B movie of you know an alien spacecraft landed in the desert. And I think that's what I like about this case. Um, but yeah, who knows? Uh, you have to make your own mind up about it. Could it be aliens? Could it be a secret experiment? It, could it just be a prank? Could Lonnie Zamora just made it up? Who knows? Um, but there you go, guys. That's just a, a, a 30 minutes of of this case to go away and make your own mind up about it. Um, but there's a little bit of a legacy, obviously Sorocco today is a, it's a tourist site so I imagine people would like to go out there and visit this site. Uh, there is a walkway that you can go to but um, people say that it's not the actual site because the actual site they fear is contaminated. Um, and as I mentioned, Samora he took a job at a gas station and he died on November 2nd, 2009, of a heart attack, and he lived till 76 years. Um, and to this day, it's become, is an inconclusive case. Um, so no one's come forward to say, yeah, it's, you know, as I said, you know, it's a, it's a, an experiment or, you know, part of NASA. But let's blame the aliens, shall we? <laughs> you know it. But there you go, guys. Hope you enjoyed that. Um, hopefully that's brought um, a little bit more evidence uh, to the table for you if you're familiar or you're unfamiliar with this case. Um, so let's talk about what I'm going to be doing next. I don't know what I'm going to be doing next. So I'm, I'm having a look at a few things. I'm not sure whether I'm going to go for something that we all know about or something that I figure you guys might not know about. So... Um, I'm going to have a think about that, but something will be coming soon next week and I'll, I'll put some preparation and work together for that. Um, but as always, I'm a proud member of the Legion Podcast Network just for a little bit of admin for the show. So please go and check out all the other shows on there, including uh, Bite Size Cinema, which I run. Uh, just had a great conversation with uh, Bo Ranzel about Event Horizon, Infinite Terror, Infinite Space. So go and check that episode out. And... Um, you can find uh, the Mystery Vault podcast and Bite Size on uh, Legion, uh, iTunes, uh, Spotify, um, YouTube and several other players. If you put in the Mystery Vault podcast into Google, it'll take you to a player. Um, also most active on Facebook, so put any 
uh, comments or give me any ideas of other mysteries that you want me to have a look at, I'd be happy to take those on. Um, so there you go, guys. Like I say, hope you enjoyed the episode. And as always, keep looking at the skies. Keep it bite. Oh, keep it bite size. Now that's my other show. <laughs> keep it mysterious. Keep it safe. And I think this is a ghost story. Because one of you sitting here in this room is a whale. If you enjoyed this show, then make sure you check out the other great shows on the Legion Podcast Network, like Cinema PsyOps, Cinema Beef, Devour the Podcasts, Duncan and Bo Come Correct, Exploding Heads Horror Movie Podcast, Friday the 13th, Get Slayed, The Hell Ming Power Hour, Hello, This is the Doom Show, Hero Hero Ghost Show, Kill the Cast, Underwater Kaiju from Outer Space, Jerry Hates Action, Legion After Dark, Mental Health, Obsessive Cinema, Discourse, Pick Six Movies, The Podcast by the Cemetery, The Podcast on Haunted Hill, The Psycho Semantic Podcast, Rick Radio, House of Wax, Dude Looks Like the 80s, Rabbit and Red Radio, The Shade Cast, Short Bus Cinema, Two Drink Minimum Commentaries, The VD Clinic, Who Will Survive Horror Podcast, and Which vs. The Doomsday Clock. With such a widespread of shows, there is guaranteed to be a niche for you to fall in love with. Horror, politics, movies, books, sex, music, commentaries, health, video games, kaiju, action, news, comedy, and opinions that would most likely get you killed in some parts of the world. We are proud to bring you some of the best podcasting in the world. Check us out at www.legionpodcast.com, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, YouTube, and any other dark corner of the internet where podcasts can be found.